Hi everyone! In this video, I'm going to discuss a number of things I've learned about watercolor since I started working with it. I am, of course, pretty new to the medium. I've been studying and practicing with it for only about half a year at this point. Some of the things I'm going to mention in this video might not be new to anyone who has actually worked with watercolor before, so I would probably classify this video as being aimed towards beginners. But I'm not going to be going over the ins and outs of watercolor here. I don't feel necessarily knowledgeable enough to make a watercolor for beginners video just yet. I guess this is more for someone who knows a bit but could use some tips and tricks. Some of these things might seem really obvious and stupid that I didn't figure them out sooner. A lot of what I've learned has been through artists who work in watercolor predominantly, artists such as Kelly McKernan, Nen Chang, Eve Bolt, and Denise of In Liquid Color. I honestly am not sure I'd be where I am now if not for YouTube and Twitch. There is a watercolor speed paint happening in the background of this video to hopefully keep you entertained, and I will talk about the actual art at the end. She is my Spring Queen companion to my Autumn-inspired Pumpkin Queen, but there will be more about her later. Actually, let's kind of start with her, because as I'm working on this, it's bringing me to my first point. Not all watercolor papers are created the same. The paper I'm using is B Papers Cold Press Paper in 140 pounds. This is actually my first time ever using cold press paper in the hopes I would be able to attain the smooth blends and gradients that I want so badly in watercolor. I've also used Fabriano Studio hot press paper, Fabriano Artistico hot press paper, and Arches hot press paper. Arches is the paper I used for the Pumpkin Queen piece, which I consider my most successful watercolor painting to date but it is incredibly expensive. I lucked out and found an Amazon seller who happened to have it available for about 30 to 40 bucks, but a lot of art stores here in Canada will sell the same pad for 60 to 70 for 12 9 by 12 sheets. Yeah. But do expensive watercolor papers matter? Yeah, they, they kind of do. In fact, some people are adamant that the paper is the most important part of a successful watercolor painting. It's crazy, right? And papers are so much more complicated than just hot press versus cold press, which are not only related to texture, i.e. hot press is smooth, cold press is textured, but also how they're made. There's also what the paper is made of. You can get 100% cotton, you can get cotton mixes, cellulose, which is made with the fibers you find in wood, and even bamboo. It's generally considered that 100% cotton is the best for watercolor though. This isn't to say that you should necessarily spend 60 to $70 on paper. There are nice papers out there that are more cost efficient for beginners. There's nothing wrong with starting out on cheaper paper either. I did just that and I'm totally fine. I survived. Sometimes I had to fight with pilling or crazy buckling, but I made it through. Which brings me to another point. Watercolor paper can pill. Some papers will pill more than others. And yeah, I mean pilling as in those weird nubbly bits you get on your clothes from chafing or overwashing. It's basically the surface of the paper becoming damaged and lifting from excessive water or being too rough with your brushes. Be gentle while blending and be aware some papers will pill easier than others. It really sucks if it does, I had no idea it could happen until my spooky moon painting, to be honest. So, all papers are different and you need to test and experiment to find one you like. But another thing? Not all paints are the same either. Even if a tube of paint has the exact same pigments, they can vary wildly in formula and even color. There's a lot at play when it comes to choosing paints too. I honestly didn't know watercolors could be granulating when I first started learning about them, which feels really stupid. I also didn't know watercolors weren't always transparent. Also a really stupid thing not to know, but when you're working with a medium that involves that much water, I don't think I'm wrong to assume transparency. The good news is that you can find affordable, beautiful watercolors for decent prices. 
My Sennelier Le Petit Aquarelle palette is one good example. It's student grade, but the quality is really fantastic and the colors are super vibrant. The Windsor and Newton Coatman paints are supposed to be great too, though I've only ever tried their Indian Red. When you're starting out, you don't need $20 tubes of paint to learn and experiment. In all likelihood, if you're like me, you'll never use the product because you're too terrified to use something that pricey anyway. By the way, not all watercolor paints are light fast even the expensive paints. If they aren't, the art will fade over time if exposed to light. This isn't a big deal if you're creating art that ends up tucked away in a portfolio or a binder, but if you're creating something to sell to someone, you don't want that piece fading away on someone's wall after a few years. Tired of dirtying your water by constantly dipping your brush in to add more water to your mix? Pipettes or eyedroppers are amazing for that. You can get a huge pack of like a hundred super cheap plastic pipettes for like $10 on Amazon, probably cheaper in America. Discovering them was an absolute life changer. Oh, and always mix more paint than you think you need. I mean, maybe there are brilliant watercolor artists out there who know how to mix the exact amount of paint they need, but for the rest of us, the last thing you want is to run out of your character's skin tone. This is something I learned really early on with watercolor, but I feel it should be stated in case someone doesn't know. Watercolor isn't meant to be made paler with white. Just add more water until you get the paler shade you're looking for. If you need to add highlights, leave part of the paper bare. If you do add white, be aware that the paint will not be as opaque and may not appear as luminous as it would if you just diluted it. You can add really stunning texture to watercolor using really simple household products. You can add rubbing alcohol or even just plain water to create cool bloom effects. The paint will expand away from the alcohol or water in different ways. You can also add salt, which is a personal favorite of mine. You sprinkle salt onto a wash and let it dry before scraping it off. Salt absorbs the paint, leaving behind a cool, kind of crystalline pattern. It can also add some sparkle as well. Okay, so I think that's it for now, so let's talk about the art a bit. As I mentioned, this piece is my spring queen. I actually have a ton of ideas for queens of winter and summer, so I may end up painting those sometime down the road too. With spring, I want to use vivid greens and blues with these pops of yellow. I always think of pastel Easter colors with spring, so I want to get away from that and use brighter, fresher colors instead, especially since I did use a lot of purple in the Pumpkin Queen, so I wanted to leave my dioxazine purple to rest for a little bit. I also wanted to paint a forward-facing profile rather than my usual three-quarter view. I'm not entirely certain why I was so interested in doing so, but I worked hard on her expression to try to get her looking more peaceful and serene in her smile versus the pumpkin queen who I think looks kind of sassy. The flowers in her crown are forget-me-nots, which are my favorite flowers and always make me think of spring. Since winter can last until late May here in Nova Scotia, I usually don't think of the crocus as being a spring flower. They usually bloom during some kind of weird late winter thaw and then they die when more snow comes. Forget-me-nots can bloom during different times of the summer too, but I always remember at my mom's house knowing spring had arrived when the forget-me-nots bloomed. There's a stream that runs through her yard and they grow all along the banks, just this blanket of pale blue flowers. Forget-me-nots also look like they have these little stars at their centers, so I kind of put that into this picture and... They aren't a very exact representation of what the flowers look like in that regard. I do need to work on my florals and my botanicals. So that's it for today. Please consider subscribing if you enjoyed this video and please give it a thumbs up. It really helps me out a lot. If you have any questions or concerns or you just want to chat, feel free to reach out to me down below in the comments or on my social medias which are linked in the description box. 
Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you at the next video. Bye!